So once more, we have a really nice criterion, a simple criterion for checking stability of our process. And we've said, uh, if we travel along S equals I omega, then if G open loop goes and encircles minus one zero, then we are unstable. We've also introduced a couple of definitions. So applying a sine wave, and we can measure a magnitude ratio and a phase angle. Uh, so that's what we can measure. And so in the real world, we have the, the basic theorem that says that if we apply uh, this approach, if we apply a sine wave at the entrance, then we can measure all these magnitude ratios. So in the real world, we know we can measure this. So all this was in the time domain. We can measure a phase shift. We can measure uh, an amplitude ratio. So all of this is quite measurable in the real world. And according to the basic theorem, this actually relates to our transfer function in this way. It says that the magnitude of G of I omega is equal to the magnitude ratio and the angle of G of I omega is equal to the phase shift. And this is quite incredible for us. This is exactly what we were looking for because now we can uh, determine our G open loop as a function of S equals I omega. So remember our whole criterion for stability is that S must equal I omega and we would look for encirclements by G open loop. And at that stage, we didn't know how to get G open loop. Or well, we knew that if we had the equation G open loop of S, then we could apply these values and we could get that. But we don't always have this function G open loop available to us. Sometimes we don't know enough about the process to develop a model and accurately determine G open loop. And now we have this incredible basic theorem that says, you don't need the equation at all. All you have to do is apply a sine wave at the inlet point and then measure the response of the process. You don't need to understand that process at all. You just need to measure its response to a sine wave. And you can measure the amplitude and you can take the ratio and that will give you the magnitude ratio. You can observe how far out of phase it is with the other sine wave and that will give you the angle. And then it turns out that these two somewhat arbitrary measurements turn out to be the, the magnitude of G of I omega and the angle of G of I omega. In other words, we can construct the function G along the path S equals I omega. So again, that's exactly what we want. There's nothing else we need to know about this process. So uh, we can note a few other things. We can say that, of course, G of I omega, the function itself, uh, that will have a real part and an imaginary part. And if uh, we express this in polar coordinates instead, then we would uh, write G of I omega as its magnitude, which is the magnitude ratio, um, and its angle, which is E to the I angle here. So we can completely express G of I omega using these two functions, right? And of course we can get the relationship between the magnitude and the real and imaginary parts and the angle and the real and imaginary parts. So that's all standard from the definition of uh, complex numbers. Uh, but this incredible proof, this is not from any definition. There's, uh, in fact, we still need to prove this to ourselves because this seems too good to be true. This is exactly what we needed. So let's prove that. So uh, first off, we can start off recognizing uh, we can define our process transfer function or uh, yeah, if this is our process transfer function, um, then we can also recognize that if we are applying a sine wave at the input, right? The sine wave function, that's our input. Then if you look at the Laplace transformations, we had derived that the Laplace transform of the sine wave is equal to this. And so we can say the Laplace version of the input looks like this. So that's our, uh, and if we break down the denominator into complex conjugates, then that's the function that we have. And then we can also say that the process itself, uh, we can generally write in this form, that there are zeros in the numerator and poles in the denominator. So generally speaking, we know any process can be 
um, we can find the equivalent to this form. And so we can say that our response y is the product of those two functions, this g and this for u. So that's what our response looks like eventually. Now we can always apply partial fraction expansion to this. We can say that, well, although this is uh, equal to y, we can seek an alternative form to this equation. So we can propose that uh, we think our function y can be rewritten as a divided by s plus i omega. That's one of the factors in the denominator here. And then b over s minus i omega. That's yet another factor in the denominator here. And all these factors in the denominator as well. And then it's just a matter of finding these unspecified constants. So we can find all these constants, a, b, c, up to z, uh, such that it's true that this function is the same as this function. And to do that, uh, we can think of multiplying each denominator here in turn by this function. So if we want to find a, we can say, well, if we multiply y by s plus i omega, then we are going to get here uh, b times s plus i omega, c times s plus i omega, da da da, all the way to z times s plus i omega. And then if we apply s equals minus i omega, well, we've already multiplied by s plus i omega, so it won't change this term, but all these terms will get zeroed out. In other words, if we multiply our original, if we multiply the left hand side by s plus i omega and uh, apply s equals minus i omega, then all those terms will vanish and it will leave us with just the value of a. So that gives us a method for evaluating a. And uh, we're doing this uh, on the left-hand side here. And, uh, and so we can see that uh, this uh, left-hand side, uh, or uh, yeah, this function, uh, can be written in this form. So if we think about our original function here, right? Uh, this was the original form before we partial fractionalized it. So if we multiply by s plus i omega, then this part actually vanishes. And what we're left with here is uh, s. Uh, so we've applied uh, s equals minus i omega. So we're going to be left with a minus 2i omega here. And so that's why we can say that we're going to get uh, this, uh, or rather this factor is going to simplify as omega over uh, minus 2i omega. And the omegas can cancel, leaving us with uh, u over bar um, over 2i. And then all this stuff on the uh, that's left over on the right, we, we'll just say that's equal to g evaluated at s equals uh, minus i omega. So that's how we can evaluate a. And then for b, we can do uh, a similar thing, this time using s equals minus i omega. So in that case, we get this factor. And then for all the remaining constants, it's the same approach, just multiplied by that. So that's how we can evaluate all those constants. And then looking at what we have there, uh, so we have ways of getting A, B, and all the rest of them. And now we have this form that we are familiar with. Remember we said when we have a constant over S uh, plus some uh, constant there, then that's equivalent to E to the power of that constant times T. So that's what we have. All these roots now, we can apply it in this way, and we can say that that's what our function will look like. So we can see here, if the system is stable, then all these Ps are uh, negative. They have negative real parts. So all these will go to zero as time goes to infinity, leaving us with just these parts, right? these two factors here. So that's what our Y of T is going to look like eventually. And so if you uh, regard this, uh, if you convert this, in, uh, if you recognize uh, this as a complex number, then of course we can rewrite this in terms of, we can say G of I omega. So looking at each of these terms, we can say G of I omega is equal to this and G of minus I omega 
is equal to, uh, and the magnitudes will be the same. You can see g of minus i omega is the same as g of i omega. And then the angles, those are in the opposite directions. Um, so we can say if we then have to add these two functions together, then it's going to look like this. And uh, this, if we uh, recognize our trigonometric functions, we can say it looks uh, like this. So this can be written simply in this polar form. And then looking at this polar form, we can see here that the magnitude is going to be this value. And so on the left-hand side, we recognize the magnitude ratio uh, that's equal to, uh, that's the factor that we introduced before, that's equal to this magnitude G of I omega. And then the angle, the shift here is the argument of G of I omega. And that's the same as the theta that we measure, yeah, that we can measure using this magnitude test. So that establishes our basic criterion. From that, we have proven that the magnitude of G of I omega is the same as the, ma the measured magnitude ratio. And the angle of G of I omega is the same as the phase angle, the difference between the two sine waves. So that establishes the proof of the basic theorem. And with that, we have exactly what we need. We have the value of G open loop as S equals I omega.